the regime of disordered cellular systems. Um, and I have to thank the previous speaker for doing so much of my work uh, for me. That was really quite generous of him. Um, so indeed, we're going to be interested in trying to understand trying to understand the properties of these kind of dense, confluent monolayers of epithelial tissue. Um, and you know, we're not the kind of first people to look at videos like this and imagine trying to coarse grain the system um, into um, treating cells as interacting geometrical, uh, geometrical units. Right? And uh, we heard a little bit about how uh, Right, how these models treat the shapes of cells. And one way you can kind of define what the shape of the cell is in this two-dimensional cross-sectional view um, is to imagine that the degrees of freedom of your model really are the individual vertices of every polygon. The vertices are free to move around. You invent rules that govern the topological transitions here. So how is it that cells are allowed to undergo rearrangements by kind of having these vertex merging and splitting events. Um, and then you go from there, right? Another kind of quite simple and I think mathematically appealing way of thinking of these cellular systems um, is the so-called Voronoi model, where instead you imagine that the degrees of freedom are just individual cell positions, right? And then the shape of the cells comes from uh, taking a Voronoi tessellation of the space around. So the shape of the cell is just given by, you know, whatever the local Voronoi area of each point is. This kind of handles the topological transitions for you and also makes generalizing to arbitrary dimension really quite easy. Really quite easy. Um, you know, for the purpose of this talk, actually, the distinction between these different sorts of models of dense tissue is really not so critical. Um, the key point is that these confluent sort of shape-based models behave really differently from particulate matter, right? One way of, one simple way of uh, seeing that is to, you know, think about phase diagrams like this for, say, soft spheres, um, where you can imagine there's, you know, a high temperature fluid phase, you can quench through a glass transition, you can densify towards a jamming transition, you can look at this kind of phase diagram and realize that in confluent tissue, actually the packing fraction of the system is always unity. By definition, all of the area is occupied by cells, so it's like you're missing an entire axis on this phase diagram. Another kind of maybe slightly more subtle difference between the two is that um, cells really interact according to who their neighbors are, neighbors defined by you know, which, uh, which cells do and do not share edges. So that is to say that two cells can be at the same distance from each other, um, but that alone doesn't tell you whether two cells are interacting with each other. And we'll see later in this talk that this kind of uh, distinction really influences the kinds of interfacial properties that you get in these cellular systems. Right. <coughs> and if this was any other <laughs> if this was any other conference, I would spend some time, you know, motivating the biology that goes into um, defining the energies per cells that we saw from the previous speaker. You know, I would tell you that, uh, you know, cells have actin cortices, there's cell-cell adhesion, kind of transmembrane proteins, there's actomyosin cabling around collections of cells. I would show pictures like this that tell you why there's a preferred height for these monolayer-like systems. There's all this biology. But, but, you know, this is a conference with geometry in the title, so why not just say that each cell is represented by some geometrical unit, right? And we'll say that there's geometrical properties like areas and perimeters. And so, as we heard just moments ago, with slightly different notation and slightly different capitalization schemes, um, we'll just say that the energy of every cell is defined as a quadratic spring tethering that cell um, to some preferred area from its actual area, and similarly a quadratic spring tethering each cell um, from its preferred perimeter to some target perimeter. Right. And then we're going to imagine studying the disordered uh, low temperature, the disordered fluid phase of these kind of models and ask what kind of properties um, what kind of properties do we see, right? And we'll do simulations either 
in equilibrium, out of equilibrium. Feel, feel free to ask for any details. It turns out for this talk, none of those details matter. So that's good. So we're, um, you know, one of the kind of motivations for the two very short stories I'm going to share today come from looking at images like this. So these are um, cellular aggregates of three different model cell lines. Um, and just looking at either the shapes of the aggregates in these kind of snapshots or viewing these videos of two aggregates coming together over time, you kind of get the impression that there's an intricate interplay between the bulk mechanical properties of these cellular aggregates, right? Whether they're kind of uh, individually fluid-like or maybe more solid-like. Um, some interplay between that coupled with apparently some effective uh, interfacial tension that's driving this sort of droplet fusion, right? So, so I'm going to ask, you know, both what sets the mechanics in the bulk of these disordered phases, and then also how does interfacial tension play out in these uh, in these models of, of these dense biological tissues? Okay. So, so first and more briefly, uh, I'll focus on the bulk behavior, right? And there's been this kind of um, long push towards viewing the dynamics of these disordered monolayers. Um, so here you're seeing a very nice experiment from about eight years ago now, um, where we're watching um, dog kidney cells on a flat substrate move around. Um, and each red arrow there is the instantaneous frame-to-frame -frame displacement. So you see these kind of somewhat collective um, uh, fluctuations in the velocity of the cellular systems. And there's been kind of a long history of people uh, interpreting this kind of data, and in particular, the kind of intermediate scale collective motion that you observe as if this was like a disordered glassy system or some, um, some low temperature fluid-like uh, phase. Right. And so let's, let's see what happens um, to the disordered mechanics of these cellular models, right? We heard a little bit about what the crystalline phase uh, elasticity is like. And one thing to quickly remind you is that um, in normal glassy systems, the kind of canonical observation is that the dynamics slow down by some enormous amount over a relatively small temperature range where, um, where in addition, there's not much change in the local structural order of the system. So for instance, if I plot some measure of the dynamics in a fluid, say the log of the viscosity, as a function of inverse temperature, um, the thing that makes glasses so hard to both study experimentally and understand theoretically, one of the things, is that you have this astronomical growth where the viscosity, say, grows exponentially or even more frequently, faster than exponentially as you drop the temperature. And so in a lot of ways, these cellular models behave somewhat similarly, um, or they seem to fit into this paradigm. As you go from kind of the normal fluid phase of the model at some high temperature, and then you start cooling down, you do indeed see some modest growth in the local structure. You see increasingly long time scales creep into the problem. So here we're looking at like the mean squared displacement of individual particles, and it goes from very simply diffusive at high temperatures to kind of caged at lower temperatures, so on and so forth. Um, but if you look at some of the details, it turns out that these models are actually really quite unusual. Um, and just as a very quick uh, representation of that, here I'm showing again a log scale of some measure of the dynamics in the system as a function of inverse temperature. Kind of every particulate glass former ever um, looks like what these black dots are doing. They go either exponentially or faster than exponentially on this plot. In contrast, these disordered cellular models have, um, have this distinctly so-called subarenius or sub-exponential scaling of the relaxation time. So actually the rate at which these models are slowing down, um, that rate is itself much slower than you would expect um, based on the kind of analogies to glassy systems that have been drawn in the past. Right? And I think, um, I mean, we already have this intuition from the last talk that the elasticity of these systems in the ordered phase is very unusual. I think a lot of this kind of 
finite temperature uh, behavior also stems from the fact that the disordered version of the zero temperature uh, phase is really quite strange. Right? You know, earlier I mentioned that there's something very different about particulate matter and these kind of confluent cellular systems. Um, in the context of the jamming transition, people often like to think about the transition happening at the point where there are enough constraints, enough interparticle contacts to satisfy, uh, to, to constrain all of the degrees of freedom, right? So, sorry, in soft spheres, you uh, start in an unjammed fluid-like state, you densify, there are more and more interparticle contacts, and when the number of those contacts equals the number of degrees of freedom in the system, that's the jamming transition. Right? These cellular models you kind of know are very weird just by doing a similar kind of argument because actually you count up the number of constraints, how many harmonic constraints are there in your Hamiltonian, you count up your degrees of freedom, and you find that you're either in the Voronoi model um, exactly at the marginal point all the time. So it's like you're at the jamming transition regardless of what the other parameters in your model are. Or in the case of the vertex model, you discover that you're always under constrained. Right? And so if you have any finite shear modulus, if you have any elasticity, you kind of know that it has to be in a very different class than the kind of um, rigidity imparted in, in normal particulate matter. And so indeed, here you see that um, if you look at the some measure of the modulus of the system, the shear modulus, as a function of one of the parameters in your system, here for the Voronoi model, you find that actually there's never a non-rigid phase um, there because you're always sitting at this um, very marginally constrained state. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that was just kind of a very brief um, introduction to say that the mechanics of these uh, disordered cellular systems I think are even weirder than people have have so far appreciated. Um, and so with that in mind, let's try to study something that avoids all of this weirdness and ask how is it that cells are able to maintain the kind of boundaries between different, uh, different cellular species, right? So here is a, um, I think, terrifying image that I lost a bet and I said I would start including in my presentations of a transgenically modified uh, fruit fly that expresses GFP in certain cells. And you can see these incredibly crisp boundaries, um, either in the thoracic cavity, which is probably somewhere around there, um, or in the different portions of the wing disc, um, just forming these incredibly crisp compartments between different, different types of cells. Okay, the fact that biology can do this is maybe not so much of a surprise. I don't have an arm growing out of my forehead yet anyway. Um, but, but how is it that they do that, right? And it turns out that this incredibly crisp uh, compartmentalization extends down to the single cell level, right? So here we're seeing uh, not fruit flies, but some kind of frog embryo extract. And we see that as a function of either correctly or incorrectly expressing some transmembrane adhesive protein, um, the two types of cells, red and green, either form this kind of rough intercalated boundary or they form this uh, incredibly crisp, sharp at the level of a single characteristic cell size uh, boundary between the two species. And how is it that cells are able to do that? I mean, like mechanically, how do they do that? Historically, people have often tried to describe this kind of cell sorting and cell segregation um, as if the two cell species were basically immiscible fluids governed by some effective interfacial tension. And you can imagine in that context that in order to get an interface this sharp, the amount of tension the cells would have to be generating would be, I mean, not astronomical, but maybe biologically implausible, right, in order to get interfaces which have kind of no roughness whatsoever. So one of the things we wanted to ask was just how is it you know, how does surface tension play out in these confluent models? And is it any different from how it plays out in uh, particulate, in particulate uh, matter? So we're going to run a bunch of simulations. Um, and we're going to take exactly the same kind of shape-based energy um, for each cell. And we're just going to decorate it with this, I mean, totally innocuous term, right? We're just going to say that 
if a red cell and a blue cell, red cell and a blue cell are in, share an edge, we'll penalize the energy by some amount proportional to the length of that interface, right? So we just put a line tension between different cell species into the problem. Biologically, actually this term is almost automatic because it's just true that cells can independently regulate actually both tensions and relative adhesions at the interfaces between different types of cells. Um, and in the model, I mean in the model anything is easy to put in, so it, it makes sense. Um, all right, so what I'm gonna ask then is if I add this kind of microscopic parameter, what happens at the mesoscale or the macro scale? How does surface tension behave when I have aggregates um, of these interacting cell types? Okay. So I'm gonna try to measure the effect of surface tension of blobs of cells. And experimentally, there's lots of kind of very cool ways to do this. So you can imagine doing this kind of parallel plate compression experiment where you're you know, exerting forces and you see how much the cell aggregates deform. You can try to do a much more microscopic measurement with uh, like a micropipette aspiration and ask as a function of, you know, pressure differences that you impose, how much, how much curvature do you get? All kinds of cool stuff, right? So to start out then, let's try to numerically mimic exactly this uh, protocol. So I'll have this blob of red cells in a sea of blue cells. I'll take these two parallel plates, and in a strain-controlled manner, I'm gonna squish this cell together, right? And as I perform this strain-controlled uh, compression, I'll measure the force that I need to exert on those plates in the simulation in order to uh, maintain them in that fixed position. O all of them, yep, yep. So this particular one is, um, is almost certainly a Voronoi model, but, uh, but everything that I'm gonna tell you about is insensitive to that difference, as far as we can tell. Yep, thank you. So, right, so the nice thing about this way of measuring effective surface tension is that um, just by knowing the long time steady state force that you need to hold a droplet at some fixed position, together with a measurement of the geometry of that deformed droplet, you can extract the effective surface tension without needing to know things like what's the viscosity of the fluid medium it's embedded in, what's the viscosity of the thing itself. Y you just, I mean, you just do force balance, right? And so the result of this kind of uh, protocol, um, if I vary a lot of stuff, I stay in the fluid regime of the model, but I vary the preferred shape parameters, I vary the temperatures that I'm running things at, I vary the microscopic value of surface tension I impose. Um, whenever I do that, the effective surface tension of the droplet that I measure, normalized by the microscopic parameter, um, is always unity. Right? O, right? Like that's kind of a fun way of saying you did this enormous amount of numerical work in order to be able to say that you measure exactly what you put into the model. I guess that's nice. Um, it shows that we can, you know, we know how to simulate things. Super. Okay, but, but right, there's lots of ways to measure surface tension. And, you know, in particular, a way that's very appealing in simulations is to look at the, um, the spectrum of interfacial fluctuations between one fluid phase and another. And one of the games you can play is to ask, like, what's the relative width of this interface? How rough is it? And you can make that quantitative by, say, asking what's the density of red cells as I go from the center of the strip out towards the other phase. And here I'm showing that density measurement of red cells as a function of system size. And for each of those, I'll measure the width just by saying how long does it take to drop off from, uh, you know, the plateau value to the other, into the other phase, okay? And why might you wanna make this measurement uh, in this way? Well, it's because I'm, I'm doing this simulation under periodic boundary conditions. So then the size of the simulation sets the longest wavelength fluctuation that I can fit into my simulation that's compatible with my simulation. Um, and so, you know, in equilibrium then, this is just a totally textbook problem of saying as I, you know, 
am able to explore different ranges of, uh, of wave vector, how should the interfacial width scale? Right? And I'll just I'll skip to the answer and tell you that the interfacial width um, squared is supposed to go like some intrinsic length scale that you don't really know how to estimate. Um, and then in two dimensions, this is the, uh, this is the finite size scaling. And qualitatively, the terms kind of make sense. Um, if you crank up the temperature, the interface can be much rougher. If you make the simulation bigger, the interface can be rougher because you're fitting longer and longer wavelength modes in. And of course, if you crank up the surface tension, you get these very sharp, uh, very sharp interfaces. OK, great. Um, so we know what we should expect, and we can measure that too. Here is just one particular example for one particular random set of parameters. This is like what the data looks like. Um, and the problem is that this data for the width squared as a function of how big a simulation I ran, you know, the problem is that this dashed red line is the equilibrium prediction. Actually, the lower bound of the equilibrium prediction setting the width squared not term to zero. Okay. Um, and it turns out that this kind of orders of magnitude discrepancy between the observed width, which is incredibly sharp, and the expected width, which is whatever you expect, is insensitive to all of the details that, um, that we could think about. So you could do kind of equilibrium simulations either of the Voronoi model or the Vertex model. You could do the kinds of lightly non-equilibrium simulations of cells actively pushing themselves in particular directions. All of those things kind of don't make much of a dent in this gap between um, the lower bound of some prediction, again, on a logarithmic scale, and um, what you would expect. So on the one hand, this is kind of a very, uh, a very kind of fun scenario we find ourselves in. It turns out this model is able to support interfaces which are mechanically just as soft and squishy as you might have expected based on whatever parameters you put into your simulation. But if you do a measurement based on how sharp the interfaces are, you find that the, the cells can support interfaces which are radically sharper than you expected. Another way of saying that is that for only a little bit of tension, you get a lot of interfacial sharpening. So on the one hand, that's kind of a, a cool mechanism that maybe cells are actually exploiting. Um, you know, on the other hand, I feel just as a matter of principle that when someone says, here's the results of an equilibrium simulation, and here's an equilibrium prediction, you know, I imagine that there's like a constellation of statistical mechanical greats gazing down at you kind of disapprovingly, you know, wondering, wondering what's going on. Um, and it turns out that the answer is in that other small difference that I told you about between confluent cell tissue and uh, particulate matter. And that's that, you know, again, cells interact precisely with who they share an edge with, not metrically, not, I mean, not based on the distances between cells. One way of expressing that in a very short time um, it is to imagine doing a very idealized calculation of what the interface interfacial properties might be, um, again, in this highly idealized geometry of square cells of red type and blue type in perfect registry with each other. Okay? And what you can s imagine um, is that if I took this starting scenario where the interface is actually decorated with a lot of high order vertices, fourfold vertices, if I perturb one cell a little bit, here I'm doing this example in the Voronoi model, but it doesn't matter. If I perturb one cell a little bit, the effect is to split one of these high order vertices into pairs of lower order vertices, right? So I'm discontinuously changing the number of cells that this uh, particle I is interacting with. That discontinuously changes the set of forces acting on that cell. And it turns out when you have spatial organizations of these high order vertices, those discontinuities in the force add coherently. Right? So, so you can quickly do the energetic calculation and discover indeed that actually these cell-based models um, provide a very natural way of living in a cusp-like energy landscape instead of an energy landscape where everything is just harmonic basins. Right? It turns out that idealized geometrical 
uh, calculation even works basically quantitatively. If you go into the simulation and you ask, like, if I try to strain individual cells and I measure the restoring force, um, what do I get? You find that instead of some hooky in system, um, as you strain even just a little bit, the mean value of the restoring force discontinuously jumps to some large value. That value is set exactly by the cost of splitting high order vertices into pairs of normal vertices. Okay, so I see I've been talking for 25 minutes, so I'll just say um, we're currently working with our experimental collaborators to try to understand if um, this potential mechanism of interfacial sharpening is something that uh, particular cell types actually, uh, actually choose to exploit. Uh, and this is just a random, very suggestive image of cells with lots of high order vertices in a place where cells need to compartmentalize. But then you might uh, you know, also note that actually the, the main kind of interest, uh, or the main kind of discrepancy in what you expected the interfacial properties to be came because cells were interacting with neighbors, not interacting according to how far cells were. And so you might ask in other systems where people have speculated topological interactions of this type to be relevant, can you see the effect of these kind of um, unusual interfacial properties? But, but so with that, let me just you know, thank, um, thank my collaborators and funding and of course you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions.